Dear colleagues, please thank you to the press, but now I would ask you please to let us start our meeting first with the adoption of our agenda, which I consider adopted. Thank you. And uh, welcoming uh, European Central Bank President uh, Mario Draghi for being here for the second monetary dialogue of the year. The previous one, as you remember, took place on 6 February. And this one uh, today will be followed also by a hearing uh, with Mario Draghi in his capacity of chair of the European Systemic Risk Board. As we all know, since uh, the last monetary dialogue, the ECB monetary stance has, has remained unchanged, uh, also relating to non-standard monetary policy measures. Uh, we all know that the Governing Council has confirmed that uh, those measures uh, are intended to run until the end uh, of the year or beyond if necessary. Uh, and in any case, until uh, a sustained adjustment of the, page of the path of inflation that will take place, uh, uh, and also that uh, the uh, Governing Council stands ready to increase uh, uh, if the, 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 the asset purchase program, uh, if the outlook becomes less favorable. So with this decision, the ECB confers that uh, it will not let the moderate but firm recovery of the euro economy be put at risk and confirms that it is equipped with necessary ammunition to respond to any economic, political or geopolitical contingency. Until now, the ECB and conventional policies have played a crucial role in repairing the monetary policy transmission channels and in supporting domestic demand and have decisively helped deleveraging across the euro area, both private and public. We are already seeing the results of this policy which should, in due course, lead to inflation evolving towards the ECB inflation target. President Draghi will present the ECB perspective on economic and monetary developments and discuss on the consequences of Brexit for euro era financial stability. The discussion will mem with members which will also cover two topics selected by the Econ Committee coordinators in preparation for this monetary dialogue namely the issue of financial innovation and the implication for monetary policy and the question whether the rising of long-term interest rates did or did not overshoot. We have done some preparatory work on these two items with the contribution of distinguished scholars, as usual. And as regards the second topic, the papers outline that the observed rise since August 2016 of the long-term interest rate is attributed to, on the one hand, the increase of, in the U.S. long-term interest rates after the reversal in the Fed's monetary stance, and on the other hand, on political tensions uh, across uh, Europe, which generated higher perceived political risk. While the former factor might continue to draft the euro era interest rate up, the second one might recede with the result of the next elections and the one we just had. Moreover, one of the paper outlined that pulling the plug on QE too soon might undo some of the benefits of QE in the periphery countries and might lead to increases in refinance costs of member states with little or no fiscal space. So we have a lot of interesting topics to discuss and we have a lot of expectations as to your presentation, President Draghi. I give you the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be back speaking to your committee for the second regular hearing of this year. I'm also pleased that you have chosen as the topic for today's hearing the role of financial innovation. This is only one element in the broader process of innovation which is taking place in the economy, but it is a decisive one given the essential role played by financial markets in resource allocation. Before addressing this topic, let me first review the economic outlook and discuss the monetary policy stance. 
The economic upswing is becoming increasingly solid and continues to broaden across sectors and countries. Real GDP in the euro area has expanded for 16 consecutive quarters, growing by 1.7% year on year during the first quarter of 2017. Unemployment has fallen to its lowest level since 2009. Consumer and business sentiment has risen to a six years high, supporting expectations of a further strengthening of growth in the coming months. Downside risks to the growth outlook are further diminishing, and some of the tail risks we were facing at the end of last year have receded measurably. The fact that domestic consumption and investment are the main engines driving the recovery makes it more robust and resilient to downside risks, which relate predominantly to global factors. Despite a firmer recovery and looking through the volatile readings of HICP, inflation over recent months, underlying inflation pressures have remained subdued. Domestic cost pressures, notably from wages, are still insufficient to support a durable and self-sustaining convergence of inflation towards our medium-term objective. For domestic price pressures to strengthen, we still need very accommodative financing conditions, which are themselves dependent on a fairly substantial amount of monetary accommodation. At its June monetary policy meeting, the Governing Council will receive an update of the staff projections and a more complete information set on which it will be able to formulate its judgment on the distribution of risks around the most likely outlook for growth and inflation. Overall, we remain firmly convinced that an extraordinary amount of monetary policy support, including through our forward guidance, is still necessary for the present level of underutilized resources to be reabsorbed and for inflation to return to and durably stabilize around levels close to 2% within a meaningful medium-term horizon. You asked me to discuss with you today the dynamics of long-term interest rates. Over the past few decades, long-term bond yields have been trending down in both nominal and real terms. While lower nominal rates reflect monetary policy, among other factors, the decline in real yields has been driven by structural factors. These factors include notably rising net savings as aging populations plan for retirement, relatively less public capital expenditure in a context of high public indebtedness, and a slowdown in productivity growth. If long-term real interest rates are to rise again to sustainably higher levels, it is those underlying causes that need to be addressed. And this requires structural action at national and European level. Our monetary policy for its part has been instrumental in addressing the cyclical component of the balance between the supply of savings and investment demands and its price stability implications. By supporting nominal incomes, our monetary policy measures stimulate investment and consumption which are preconditions for inflation to climb back to levels below but close to 2%. And a more dynamic economy over time will favor a healthy return to higher policy interest rates. Now let me move to the relevance of financial innovation. The relation between savings and investment leads me to the topic you've chosen for today's hearing. Greater financial efficiency in the euro area is crucial in improving the allocation of capital and ensuring it is 
put to productive use. Innovation in financial instruments, services, and infrastructure, as well as changes in the organization of financial markets, can play a useful role in this respect. Financial innovation is a continuous process. Innovations had constantly arisen in the past. Past examples of innovation include the introduction of secured debt and of preferred stock, which were developed to align incentives between parties and address information asymmetries. Some innovations of the past were instead introduced to minimize transaction costs, and they have become part of our everyday lives. For example, take credit cards or ATMs. Today, FinTech, the application of new technologies to banking and financial services, is a potentially transformative force. We are closely monitoring its development for several reasons. To better understand its impact, to assess the risks, and to adjust the regulatory environment and supervisory approaches where needed. And also to adapt as an institution and support innovation where justified. Let me now give you some concrete examples of why FinTech is directly relevant to our tasks. A deep knowledge of the channels through which monetary policy affects the economy is of crucial importance for us. As FinTech and financial innovation more broadly have the potential to impact on the way the economy is financed, in the future they may affect the transmission mechanism of monetary policy and ultimately financing conditions. As the central bank for the euro area, we thus remain vigilant and make sure that changes in the financial landscape are closely tracked. As central bank of issue for the euro, the ECB and the euro system also have a statutory interest in the safety and efficiency of payment systems and market infrastructures. One of the most active fields of fintech innovation which might affect the processing of payments and securities is that of distributed ledger technologies, DLTs, such as the blockchain. Given the rapid pace of development in this field, there is a need to constantly monitor and assess potential new or more pronounced risks resulting from the application of new technologies such as DLTs to payment, clearing and settlement infrastructures in particular. One such possible risk is an increase in market fragmentation if different DLT approaches were to become firmly established in parallel in different member states. Moreover, the Eurosystem oversight framework has to remain effective if we are to discharge our responsibility in this new environment. And the euro system will of course continue to act in accordance with its mandate to promote the smooth operation of payment systems. FinTech also gives the financial sector more generally a chance to provide more efficient and effective services to households and companies. FinTech can, for instance, make it easier for banks to adjust their business models, cut costs, and exploit, exploit new business opportunities. Fintech companies can also complement the lending capacity of banks by acting as an additional channel for accessing credit, for instance, through peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. This may, in turn, help to reduce the macroeconomic fallout from disruptions in the provision of bank credit to households and firms, including smaller ones. At the same time, the increasing relevance of non-banks and digital innovation in the provision of financial services may also harbor new risks. It is, for instance, essential to assess and adapt the prudential framework to cater for the increased role of non-banks and financial innovation. 
ensure the existence of a level playing field for both new and existing players, and provide supervisors with adequate tools to address new risks. To this end, we are actively involved in ongoing work at both European and international levels. Furthermore, risks stemming from the use of new technologies need to be carefully managed, particularly in the context of heightened cybersecurity concerns. Cyber risk has long been a priority for national and European supervisory authorities. Since day one, the ECB banking supervision has also addressed the issue from various angles. As financial market infrastructure overseer, we also need to ensure that individual systems as well as the network as a whole are operationally resilient to cybercrime. While we are closely monitoring potential risks from fintech, we also contribute to financial innovation by acting as operators. The Target 2 Securities T2S platform that went live in June 2015 is now a cornerstone of the Capital Markets Union project and has given a strong impetus to promoting and creating harmonized, integrated, and efficient Euro payments and securities post-trade services. The ECB is also acting as a catalyst in the creation of a truly single European market for payments and securities. Financial integration and financial development are distinct, but interrelated concepts. Therefore, in designing the necessary institutional and regulatory frameworks, we need to make sure that financial integration and financial development reinforce each other, thus improving the performance of the financial system. This is why EU legislators have an important role to play. A Europe-wide harmonized and principles-based framework to regulate fintech in the context of the Capital Markets Union agenda would indeed help to create a level playing field from the outset. This would in turn foster cross-border investment and expansion. So, as you can see, FinTech has the potential to improve efficiency in the financial sector, create better products, and push prices down for consumers. But it has other dimensions too, in the shape of potential risks and new regulatory questions. It's in all our interest to rise to this challenge. As fintech involves the entire financial sector, different regulatory responses are likely to be needed. Depending on the nature of fintech activity, those responses may need to encompass prudential, consumer protection, and other regulation. But at the same time, they should not hamper healthy developments. Allow me to conclude. The euro area economic outlook is improving and downside risks are moderating. However, these positive signs should not distract from the need for firmer and higher structural economic growth. In this context, higher productivity growth is needed. And that productivity growth requires innovation. Structural reforms are essential to create a business environment that is conducive to innovation and a regulatory environment that adapts accordingly. Both national and European level initiatives can contribute to this effort. If we want to make sure that our economic and monetary union thrives, we need to upgrade the institutional framework. This means that we should be ready to foster innovation wherever necessary, including in the functioning of the EMU. In that spirit, I look forward to the debate that will be opened up by the upcoming European Commission reflection paper on deepening the economic and monetary union. Thank you for your attention, and I'm now available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, President Draghi, uh, for your very rich introductory statement. In particular, we appreciate a very 
in-depth analysis on uh, fintech and financial innovation. This committee has recently adopted also a report on this topic, and I think our assessment are pretty much in line. Uh, we start now with our question and answers. The first speaker is Mr. Brian Hayes. Thank you, President Draghi, and welcome back again to ECON. Uh, and it's very good and encouraging to hear your remarks on FinTech, which, as our chairperson said, recently went through the European Parliament. So you, you outlined the risks and opportunities on FinTech, I think, which, you, which we all uh, welcome. And uh, other colleagues, I'm sure, will, will ask you questions on that. I have two questions, uh, President Draghi. The first question uh, is, is a Brexit-related question. Uh, and it's to do with the question of banks relocating from the UK to the Eurozone area. As you know, the ECB, in cooperation with national regulators, takes the final decision on granting a banking license to those who want to establish within the Euro area. So you're a key role, you have a key role in that. And given remarks that have been made by Daniel Neuer, uh, your colleague, uh, remarks that have been made by Esma and Iopa about a potential race to the bottom, a regulatory race to the bottom, when it comes to supervisors in the Eurozone um, not creating a level playing pitch, what can the ECB do to make sure that there is a level playing pitch when it comes to the decision as to which of the member states of the Eurozone some of these banks may move to? Uh, what's the ECB doing there? Uh, I think it's an important question. And then my, my second question is an, an Irish-specific question. As you know, from our banking crisis, uh, we, we have a, a, a bank, one of the banks in total public ownership, the Allied Irish Bank. It's one of the 125 systemically important banks under ECB um, operations. Um, you're aware the Irish government uh, want a partial sale of Allied Irish Bank. And uh, my, I have two questions for you. One, um, do you think that now is the time for a partial sale? And could you uh, say uh, to this committee, to the Irish people, from your view, what are the long-term benefits of that in terms of a better uh, banking, a more stable banking environment for, for the Irish people, uh, but also in terms of the future stability of the banking system in Ireland? Thank you, indeed. Thank you. On, um, on your first question, of course, the uh, ECB is preparing internally for all possible implications coming from the withdrawal process of uh, relevance across the wide range of ECB staffs, and this uh, also applies to supervisory aspects. Now, banks are preparing for the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and planning the necessary steps. We are uh, in touch with all of them. We're following closely this process. Uh, in le but, it, of course, as, as you pointed out, it's not only up to us, but also up to the national competent authorities to follow this. Now, of course, we, uh, we, are stand, uh, we stand ready to support the banks to reorganize their activities in, uh, in the euro area. And um, it's very important that these banks undertake all the necessary preparations in a timely manner. So the first thing is to be timely. By the way, we'll have a chance to discuss this perhaps in the context of different questions, but many of the risks that people view in the, in the Brexit process have to do with the way this process is going to be managed. In, inherently, if it's well managed, many of these risks will never materialize. The management, however, has several actors, one of which is the banks themselves. So they have to start preparation at an early time. Now, we, we got to ensure that all banks that operate in the euro area meet the standards of the European banking supervision. And uh, so the, uh, it's important that neither the safety nor the soundness of our banking system are going to be worse after the, after the process. However, as you pointed out, there are actually risks of supervisory fragmentation and supervisory gap that the SSM currently cannot address. Banks might choose to set up broker dealers or, or third country branches both of which would not be supervised at the European level. Here, you as legislators would need to act to ensure that similar risks are treated similarly and that regulatory arbitrage is to be avoided. So very important, the role of the European Parliament in, uh, in this process. Now, on, on your second question, first, first of all, let me say it's entirely up to the Irish government 
to determine the appropriate timing of a return of part of the government stake in AIB to the private market. More generally, it, it, it's, it's quite desirable to transfer the risks of equity holdings in banks from the taxpayer to the private sector. I would like to note that the process of repairing the balance sheets of Irish banks has advanced significantly since the crisis. Silly progress is there, great progress is there. Thank you. Thank you also for raising the issue of broker deals and risk to race to the bottom. We are, of course, aware of that and, and we look forward to strong cooperation between all the relevant actors, including national competent authority, in order to, to positively address uh, this, uh, this uh, risk. Pervash uh, Perez. Well, I don't know if it's a, a good example, but I'll um, imitate the EPP by asking two questions. First of all, uh, President, you are one of the authors of the Five Presidents Report, and this report um, is perhaps becoming more topical once again. And you, in fact, indicated that in terms of EMU's functioning, the, que the institutional questions need to be raised again at some point. And we see some ideas cropping up here and there. For example, the idea of uh, transforming the SSM into a European monetary fund, which wouldn't necessarily be a community system, but an intergovernmental one. Well, do you think that this is in uh, line with the spirit of the Five Presidents Report? Do you think this is the right approach, one which would allow EMU to work uh, correctly and ensure that um, it respects the balance uh, between the EU level and the member state level in terms of fiscal policy. My second question relates to the ECB's exit uh, policy from the current uh, policy you have a commitment to meet by the end of the year, and we see different ideas here, different assessments of uh, how communication on this should be done and uh, regarding what you will do after the end of the year, uh, particularly taking into account wage developments. In Berlin last week, what we heard was rather that as of June, some indicators, for example, wage indicators, would uh, allow us to develop some idea about uh, how we can exit from current monetary policy. Could you tell us a little bit more about that today? Thank you. Um, I agree. I agree with you. I mean, even though I shouldn't say, because being one of the others, that the five presidents' report remains, in a sense, the uh, if at least is the first attempt to have a blueprint for for further progress in the future. Um, as such, as you know, it, it has to sort of considers two different horizons: one, in the, what to do in the short term; another one, what to do in the longer term. Uh, the the change the change in the in the purposes of the ESM are part uh, of uh, something that is probably more for the longer term than uh, to the extent that they do require changes in the treaty. In any event, let me say that it's very too, it's way too early to say something precise in this uh, in this manner in this matter, uh, and that um, we we just we will have to further start to have further study and. Um, it, but what's important here is really we don't have a piecemeal approach. What's important is that we are able to uh, collectively define a path that we want to follow, a path that will necessarily drive us to a, a convergence that is more and more based on institutions building and less uh, rules on rules only as it is today. Uh, but, uh, but so that's very important that we have a sort of an overall encompassing path and not a piecemeal approach to the creation of institutions. Um, the second point concerns our um, our monetary policy. Well, we we have to, as you know, next week we'll have a governing council meeting. It's going to be a monetary policy governing council meeting, and by then the uh, governing council will have the new staff projections. Um, what we've seen so far is that, as I, as I said in my introductory statement, while growth 
outlook is improving and will continue to improve uh, while the recovery is uh, indeed solid because it's more and more based on consumption and not on exports. And, um, and it's broad because it's, uh, it's now across, uh, across various countries and sectors. Um, well, one thing that, uh, that we always, uh, in a sense, uh, refer to as far as broadening of the recovery is an index we calculate about taking, uh, it's a dispersion index of the growth in value added across different countries. The, the less dispersed the, the, is this index, uh, the, the, more, the, more br the broader is the recovery. And, um, and we see now today is that the value of this index today is at the same level as it had in 1997. So way, way before the crisis, which seems to say that basically many of the problems that we had with the crisis, like uh, financial fragmentation, the problems with our monetary policy transmission, and the very uneven growth uh, across different members of the Eurozone are now uh, overcome, are behind us. At the same time, when we turn our eyes to inflation, we see that inflation is, um, is uh, in underlying inflation is still subdued, although the headline inflation has gone up to 1.9%. It was mostly due to changes in energy prices. And as the energy prices may decline, we do expect and headline inflation will also decline as well. But underlying inflation, excluding food and energy, uh, is actually being subdued. And one of the reasons for this is, uh, as, as I've said, several times is that the wages, uh, wage growth is still, is still subdued. Though we start observing the beginning of some, some growth in various parts of the euro area and some growth in producers' prices as well, it's still very, very early to make us think that we're gonna change, uh, we're gonna change um, the monetary policy stance. In other words, the projections that we had so far were predicated on us maintaining the extraordinary support to monetary policy accommodation that is in place. Thank you. Thank you. Notice Marias. Thank you very much, Mr. Draghi. Now, when and under which conditions can the ECB, or will the ECB, decide to allow uh, Greece to be part of QE. So, uh, and how can the uh, bond market become part of the program? The Central Bank of Greece, in, between 2015 and 2016, has, has spent 40 billion odd euros. So, under which conditions can the Central Bank of Greece managed to buy bonds from Greek companies and Greek banks, thus supporting development in Greece and creating uh, growth and jobs. President, I'd also like to put to you the following proposition on monetary policy in the Eurozone. This is a proposal that I put to the Parliament on the 7th of May in Strasbourg. Mr. Draghi, the European system of central banks, well, could it be more flexible? Could it be made more decentralized so that the national bank in each member of the Eurozone could have its own monetary policy that would be better adapted to the economy of that country, whilst also having uh, other non-monetary uh, uh, tools available to it as well? and so that countries could work on the basis of their current balance sheet. What I mean is that uh, the Bank of Greece, through using QE, could conceivably have a monetary policy that would be better adapted to the needs of the Greek economy, thus creating money. We're talking about something like 70 billion euros. The 2% of the uh, 
the capital of the ECB is held by the Bank of Greece. So, I mean, I think that that would be one source of investment for us. The, the response to your first question is, first of all, what is needed is a positive conclusion of the current negotiation. From this viewpoint, we certainly welcome the staff level agreement that was reached, and we regret that uh, a clearer definition of the debt measures was not reached in, in, the, last, in the last Eurogroup. Um, then we will have the debt sustainability assessment of the other institutions, uh, but then also we'll have to have a debt sustainability that the ECB and the Governing Council in its full independence will have to undertake. And this will uh, have to show that that is sustainable also in adverse scenarios, and we'll also take our decision based on risk management considerations, as we've said, uh, as we've said uh, repeatedly. So first, let's uh, have an agreement and let's uh, full agreement. Let's find uh, uh, measures, debt measures that will make the uh, debt sustainable through time. On, uh, on your, second, uh, your second proposal is, well, I mean, if we were to have uh, 19 central banks with 19 different monetary policies, uh, we'll end up naturally having 19 currencies. And that's the basis of having one currency is to have one, uh, one monetary policy. And all our objectives are defined as objectives for the whole of the euro area, not objectives for the single country. As, uh, as when we talk, for example, about uh, inflation, uh, we talk about inflation for the euro area as a whole and not inflation for one country as opposed to another country. Thank you. Just a second. Uh, well, just a minute. My proposal was very clear. I asked you a question about the Bank of Greece. Under QE, the Bank of Greece has spent 42 billion euros. But the question is, under which conditions could the Bank of Greece also buy bonds from Greek companies and uh, from Greek banks within the framework of QE? We're to if and when uh, QE will be extended to Greece, we will uh, certainly have the eligibility of uh, whatever Greek, uh, Greek companies um, in the uh, corporate bond purchase program, provided they satisfy the eligibility criteria that have been set for the companies to be part of this program. Thank you. Uh, Ramon Tremosa. Grazie, Presidente Gualtieri. Uh, President Thank you very much. Uh, welcome again, President Draghi, to the European Parliament. Um, since June 2016, the European Central Bank has purchased more than 75 billion euros of bonds from private corporations under its corporate sector purchase program. I always have had doubts over this program. I'm afraid we are distorting competition among Eurozone enterprises. Moreover, the lack of transparency makes it even worse. At least in Germany, we have a best practice of the Bundesbank uh, publishing the names of the companies, but it is not the case of some uh, central banks in the south of the Eurozone. So not even it is very difficult to know which companies that is being purchased, but the volumes are not published in an adequate way. This is why, together with so many MEPs of this uh, committee, we have asked the ECB for clarif clarifications of this program through our written questions that we sent you two weeks ago. So, in our opinion, this lack of transparency at national central bank level is harming the ECB, and it is a pity, as the ECB has made great strides towards more transparency. For instance, the publication of the minutes of the Governing Council or the publication of the target two balances that I myself have been defending for years in this house has shown that the more transparency there is, the stronger the ECB becomes in front of the public. So my question is, is the ECB going to put up guidelines to ensure more transparency at national central bank level in the CSPP? Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, well, while um, while we, you will get a written answer to your question, of course, as, uh, as there was a, a written question, but let me say just a few things at this stage. We have six national central banks that undertake, uh, that are part of this program, and they do publish a list of uh, CSPP holdings available for securities lending. Interested market participants can obtain necessary information by looking at the data published by the NCBs with market data providers and also on the ECB's website. An online database search can be performed for each of these and among other information, the search will also return the bonds issuer and its residence. Each purchasing National Central Bank has discretion to decide whether it will publish any additional information in addition to the bonds ISINs on its website. So it's not so much in our hands, it's in the hands of National Central Banks. But we are of the view that the information provided by the NCBs is sufficient and we see no reason to try to centralize the publication which certainly right now is completely in the hands of national central banks. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get further, further responses in our written <coughs> response. Um, yeah, time for a follow-up, yes. Yes, I have two minutes. Um, uh, dear President Draghi, without enough transparency, I think that we have the danger that monetary policy is misused by certain central banks to feed crony capitalism. For instance, the main important newspaper in, in Spain, Expansion, published that uh, there were rumors that only three big companies in Spain uh, had received uh, more than 50% of all the purchases done in Spain. So I think that we should uh, have uh, this information uh, concentrated at the ECB level from all national central banks, because if not, we are doing business as usual, and it is very difficult for us to justify this in front of our electorate. What is the market discipline in this sense? Or we are feeding uh, uh, companies that uh, are not viable in the markets? Well, let me assure you that the companies are being chosen on the basis of risk eligibility criteria that there isn't any intention to favor one company or another. And uh, there are certain guidelines, and of course there are volumes that are being decided by the purchasing banks to, together with the ECB. But we are, no, we are not going to disclose the guidelines or to disclose the volumes because you would simply foster activity by market participants which could actually hamper the achievement of our objectives. When we'll finish this no. program? No, the time is over. But. It's not foreseen, it's just part of the ongoing program. It's like uh, normal, the, what I said before, it's part of our monetary policy stance. So it will be decided by the Governing Council. Thank you. Uh, Miguel Urban Crespo. Gracias, Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Draghi. The issue of the banking bailout is uh, still causing political and legal ripples in my country. As you'll know, Deloitte were fined for their role in auditing Bankia before the bailout. And it has been shown that they presented a report with 12 clear mistakes which hid the real losses of Bankia. In recent weeks, a judge has decided to charge one of Deloitte's associates for uh, Bankia being on the stock market and the auditor in question has been held civil, given civil liability. And a charge could also mean that uh, Deloitte are no longer used as a as auditors, then with Rodrigo Rata, when he was the chair of Bankia, gave contracts to Lezard, which at the same time he was receiving payments from that company in an overseas bank account. Now, unfortunately, what has happened in my country is also happening throughout Europe with banking bailouts. And we have seen how the big four auditing companies have benefited from a huge business in bailouts, as was recently pointed out in a Transnational Institute report. However, these are the companies that are still being used 
um, and has been seen, for example, with the uh, Banco Popular in Spain recently, and the ECB is still using them. We think this puts the European financial sector in a very, very risky and vulnerable situation. And we would like to ask you the following. What can the ECB do as a responsible supervisor to finish this uh, situation of oligopoly and stop these things happening again? And also, have you thought about using a public, independent public auditor, which would mean that there is no longer dependency on the private um, sector and would remove us from the situation of the current situation of oligopoly? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, of course, I won't comment on specific institutions. Um, let me tell you that I'm going to uh, give you a written response because at present time it's not clear who, to me, I mean, I'm not uh, to me, uh, who actually chooses the auditors and what's the choice process of the auditors. So whether it's the ECB, the SSM part of the ECB, the supervision part of the ECB, uh, or it's the commission, or it's Digicomp, or it's both. Uh, it's just something that I will be able to explain better in a, in a written response. The proposal to have an independent public auditor is uh, something that still uh, we're thinking about, it, but I just at the moment I, I don't have an, any, uh, any view about that. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Lamberts. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. Two questions. I'll, I'll try to be very quick. On the Eurozone, of course, uh, the new situation in France may offer possibilities. I'd like to ask you to classify the idea of a, a Eurozone budget with corresponding borrowing capacity into one of three baskets. A must-have, a nice-to-have, or something we should not have in order to guarantee the sustainability of the common currency. The second question is regarding uh, labor market reforms. The kind of reforms that you have been advocating uh, goes in the direction of flexibilizing the labor market pretty much in the line that, uh, of uh, reforms that were made in Germany uh, under, by the way, a red-green government uh, in the early uh, uh, notice. Now, what we see is that when employment goes up, uh, it is usually uh, in a way that uh, most new jobs are part-time jobs, are not uh, indefinite term jobs. So are, are really, I wouldn't say all of them are shitty jobs, but are, they are going into the direction of weak quality. Uh, what interests me is the, not the unemployment rate, but the employment rate. And the employment rate expressed in full-time equivalent culminates at 75% in Sweden, is only 68% in Germany, 63% in Belgium, 55 in, in, in Italy. And when you look at the labor market dynamics from that metric, you cannot imagine any kind of growth rate that would bring us anywhere close to full employment. So maybe the kind of structural reforms we need for the labor market policy, and I would link that to, to fiscal uh, reforms and to social security reforms, are maybe not exactly the ones that you would advocate. I'd like to have your thoughts on that. Well, on your first point, uh, it's, it's, time, um, it's time for reflection, and uh, it's time for uh, thinking about the future and it's time to outline what the future will be in a, in a way that is more uh, defined, clearer, and probably more, um, I would say, more um, long seen than it's been done before. So it's time to think about now about whether our um, rules-based convergence framework is uh, still uh, can be whether it's where it can be improved it's um, the experience of the last few years tells us that the monetary union the economic and monetary union uh, has actually resisted to the crisis but going very close to very close to very critical situations and uh, therefore it's uh, it's just uh, natural to think about a construct that is being um, 
is being threatened in such a serious way less frequently than we've been in the past. So from this viewpoint, uh, the European, the Economic Monetary Union remains, uh, remains fragile and it needs to be completed. And we know that, uh, that uh, part of its fragility depends on the fact that it's not been completed yet. So we have to move forward. We have to move forward on different plans. Uh, there are many things that we can do quite, uh, quite quickly or in a relatively short time. There are other things that we may want to start working for. It's, um, it's very important that we start thinking uh, without fear of changing, uh, for example, without fear of changing the treaties if needed. And, um, and uh, already to take a decision like this, namely start thinking without being bound by the existing uh, treaties is a big step forward. Um, the, 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 we've said several times that uh, some, let's call it fiscal capacity, was an important way to complete our union. And um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is the union would become much more solid in, uh, in, uh, in resisting to shocks that hit different parts of the union in different ways. And uh, also because if we look at any, any union has a federal budget. So it's, um, it's been, now the problem is how do we get there? Not the problem, I mean, the, the, what we have to look is how do we get there? And here the answers continue to be what we've said in the past, namely that to move there you need, first of all, trust between countries, between, and you need convergence. You need convergence towards a, a certain, in other words, a, a too heterogeneous union will be inherently fragile. And, and so, in order to move uh, to greater convergence, one, first of all, needs to finish doing what's been planned and done until now it has to be completed. But also, uh, convergence in policies is very important. Convergence run, run serious structural reforms, serious economic and fiscal policies, complete the banking union. All this is part and parcel of the convergence process. The, so now, let me come to the second point, uh, labor market reforms. I think that by and large, in many parts of the Union, first of all, it, it is true, uh, what you say is absolutely true, often the increase in, uh, in employment is not, even though it's very significant, let's, just, let's not forget, five million jobs have been created in the last three or four years. More, many more that were created before the crisis. And um, so, from this viewpoint, that's a positive news. Now, it's also true that uh, some of this job creation is not, uh, is not of good quality. It's also true. So what to do about that? Uh, it, it, first, also let me say that by and large, most member countries of the Union have undertaken reforms of their labor markets in order to make them more flexible. But now there is another set of reforms that have to be undertaken, namely to grant, to, to, make, to, to create a situation where the newly employed would also have the skills to have a long-lasting employment. And to have the skills, that's where we have to reform, our, or some of us have to reform our educational system. That is also the other part. So in other words, as much as one may have insisted in the past in making labor markets more flexible, one should insist today in uh, upgrading our educational system so as to create uh, jobs having a long-lasting timing and quality. Which, by the way, would also be accompanied by higher wage growth because it would go up together with productivity. So it would be a win-win situation from all viewpoints. Thank you. And of course, I don't need to remind that this committee and this parliament has adopted a report which propose a way in to proceed jointly to stronger convergence and providing such a tool for absorbing shocks. And it is an ambitious but realistic at the same time. Proposal. Uh, Gerolf Annemans. 
Er, um, ik wil toch nog eens. Now, usually you give a standard response to this, but I'd like to give it another try and ask the question of when QE is going to stop, which I think is having a very negative effect on uh, savings and pension funds in a large part of the euro area. The ECB is not involved in politics. You say you're only doing this for the objectives of price stability. Others say that uh, you have a political objective, which is to pay for state debt in Greece and make sure that Germany has a cheap currency. But the fact is that the stretch of uh, 500 billion on your um, balance sheet is very serious. And there seems to be only one agreement which you are prepared to honor, which is that you won't go above 33% of state debt of a euro area member. You uh, reacted quite vehemently when questions were asked in the Dutch Parliament recently about the fact that uh, if there were a default situation, you may end up paying a political role. You said that this was a zero probability ev event. But I'd like to put the question in a slightly different way. If you have to re re respect the 33%, could you say that which country would have to cut their state uh, debt as a result of this in the context of the QE program, of course. Thank you. Um, let me say immediately that we are aware that the situation, a protracted situation of very low interest rates, do indeed uh, uh, require. Uh, well, do indeed uh, are a challenge for uh, for mostly for pension funds and insurance companies, and more generally for individual savers. Uh, there are certain many things that can be done to address this situation by both pension funds, insurance, and savers. But uh, and, and these are certainly actions that uh, that need to be taken, are being taken, as a matter of fact. But certainly they they are a challenge. However. The reason why this is so is because, as I've said many times, the situation did require low interest rates as a prerequisite to restart the recovery, which we are on a good way to actually deliver now. And uh, let me also add that uh, as far as the reasonings or the, or the reasons that are often quoted by several pa parts because of, for, for our program, I'll restate what I said, namely we are bound by the law to our mandate, which is to pursue price stability as defined of reaching the rate of inflation, which is below but close to 2%. And that's what we've been doing. And that's why we created and we introduced the asset purchase program. And that's why we've been buying bonds regularly at the rhythm that now it's 60 billion euro per month. And, um, and that's, but also we are also, as much as we are aware of the side effects that these programs might have, we're also aware of the fact that we're also bound by the treaty not to do monetary financing. And that's the reason why we had this issuer limit, issue in issuer limits in, uh, in our program. Having said that, we are, and we are seeing that the program continues to run smoothly. We don't plan, the governing council has never planned to break the limits. The limits are there and they will stay there. I'm not in a position now to respond to your question, which countries we are going to go buying less bonds now and uh, uh, in order to respect these limits. Thank you. Thank you. Beatrix von Storch. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Draghi. At the beginning of this year, you responded to a colleague by uh, the colleague's question, that's Mr. Valli and Mr. Zani, uh, they were talking about the uh, Target 2 system. Since uh, the 18th of January, we got an answer from you. If, uh, if a country were to leave the euro system, it's national central banks in English. To be would need to be settled in full. Now, that answer dealt with the hypothetical scenario of an exit from the eurozone. And that wasn't really what was being asked about, but... Uh, of course, exit from the Eurozone is a worst-case scenario. And if we're talking about uh, ifs and whens, then 
maybe we could talk about a scenario that would be uh, closer to us than uh, uh, maybe an actual exit from the Eurozone. So I'm quite surprised by the answer that you gave to the Dutch Parliament at the beginning of the month. At that occasion, you were asked what, happened, what would happen if a member of the Eurozone were to restructure their debts or would have to uh, restructure their debts. Not leaving the Eurozone, but restructuring. Your answer was, we don't want to speculate about the probability of things that have no chance of happening. And then you said, why did you ask me that? So... That's the question that I am asking you, however, and I'm uh, referring you to the answer that you gave to my colleague, uh, Mr. Valley, uh, uh, in January, when you did talk about a hypothetical scenario, a hypothetical worst-case scenario. So what I'm asking you is, what would happen if a member of the Eurozone were to end up being insolvent and would be forced to restructure their debts, particularly given the huge quantities of uh, sovereign bonds that lie in the, uh, the ECB reserves. Why doesn't the ECB do the same as happened in 2010 when, uh, when Greece was about to go bankrupt and the ECB bought up Greek uh, bonds in, uh, in a massive uh, manner to try and prevent Greek go Greece going bankrupt? Now, let me um, just give you two, uh, two or three quick answers. First of all, I reiterate the euro is irrevocable, and this is the treaty. So don't try to link that restructuring with euro issues or settling the target to liabilities. Second, you, you actually asked me what happens when a, when, a state, when a sovereign state restructures its debt. I answer, look at Greece. Third, you're saying that we are bearing risks for the whole of the euro area because of the bonds that the ECB has bought in various countries? The answer is there is no risk sharing other than a limited amount. So in the greatest part, the risk of a debt restructuring falls upon the National Central Bank. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus Ferber. Yeah, vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Thank you, President. Well, I, I will talk about something topical, but um, slightly more harmless. In March, we had a record in uh, Germany. Uh, we had a target to um, 1.2 billion um, surplus and in a series of other member states in the um, south of Europe, there were considerable deficits building up. So what do you see about this? Do you think this is a sustainable situation? Last time around, you uh, talked about this being related to quantitative easing. But in that case, France should have a positive balance, whereas France actually has a balanced target uh, balance. So I haven't quite understood this. And what do you, measures do you think need to be taken in order to bring the situation back into balance, uh, similar to the one we had pre-crisis? Thank you. Um, now, let me first observe that the current increase in target balance, I will say in a moment why it's very different from what we observed in uh, 2012, 2013, at the time of uh, our arguably the most serious crisis. Now, this, uh, the increase in target two balances is closely linked to the decentralized management uh, implementation of our monetary policy. And uh, much of it is uh, produced by our asset purchase program. Why? Um, just let's think, of, let's observe that about 80% of the counterparts to central banks that sell the bonds are outside the borders of the country where the central bank is located. And 50% of the counterparts are non-euro area members. So the bank, the, the, uh, the central bank of a certain country sells, uh, buys the bonds from these counterparts, but they, these counterparts then use the cash to deposit this not necessarily or generally not with the central bank that sold the bonds, but use these proceeds to deposit them 
with uh, the central bank of large financial centers, first and foremost the Bundesbank. In this way, the, the final uh, reporting will be a liability, a target to liability by the uh, central bank uh, that has sold the bonds and a target to asset by the German Bundesbank or, Bund or, or banks equally settled in large financial centers. So the first consideration is that uh, it has to do with a decentralized way in which our monetary policy is implemented. The second point is, uh, however, is that our monetary policy uh, is, is operates to the system in producing a so what we call a portfolio rebalance. Namely, the, um, the sellers of these bonds would use these, uh, these proceeds to buy other, other assets equities or other types of bonds, both located in the euro area or outside the euro area, depending. So we have to follow all these movements in order to understand that the increase in target tool liabilities is associated with uh, a loss of interest by the sellers of these bonds into assets of a specific country. Um, finally, let me tell you why this is different from what the, the increase in target tool liabilities we saw, we watched in 2012 and 13, was basically due to the fact that the banks, uh, banks in the euro area, all of a sudden saw, especially in the periphery of course, saw that their market-based funding was drying up. And therefore they had to be refinanced by the national central bank uh, of, um, of in their jurisdiction. And this created target two liabilities which are quite dramatic. But they were really dramatic because they basically showed a, the fact that these banks were really looking for assets from the central banks. Today, so in this sense, it's a demand-driven process. Today, the situation is different. It's a supply-driven process because we, are, we, the national central banks, are selling assets to the commercial, to the various counterparties, both commercial banks, pension funds, savers, insurers, and so on. And so it's this portfolio rebalance which generates, given the decentralized nature of our monetary policy implementation, generates such high target tool liabilities. Do we observe signs of stress in the markets? Not, not, not right now. If we look at funding conditions, they are very favorable both for commercial banks and for uh, non-financial companies and for the real economy. Were we observing uh, stressed conditions in 2012 and 13? Certainly so. We saw, we, we, you remember, very high interest rates, very uh, great difficulty in finding financing. So the situations are inherently different between then and now. Thank you. Jakob von Feitzsäcker. Thank you, Chair. P President Draghi, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I have two questions for you. The first concerns the prospect, not in the immediate future, but nevertheless of an interest rate reversal. You've given us a, a very impressive picture of the broadening of the recovery, and yes, obviously, uh, price dynamics is still subdued, but nevertheless, now might be a good point to reflect on what an interest rate reversal might mean, in particular, what it might mean as a challenge for high debt, uh, low growth economies. Um, and so my question is this, which aspects of the current discussion we're having on the serious deepening of monetary union would be particularly helpful to immunize our monetary union against systemic disruptions stemming from such challenges? And more specifically, um, how should the sovereign bank nexus be dealt with in this context? Uh, I believe a solid answer to that question uh, would also make it much easier to achieve uh, political consensus for fiscal backstop of ba for banking union um, and agreement on European deposit insurance. So that's my first question. The second question um, has to do with the file I'm working on, the CCPs. Uh, obviously, uh, Brexit poses a serious challenge to the um, uh, regulation of the financial sector. Um, uh, some of that can be dealt with by strengthening the third country regime. 
third country equivalence regime, accepting basically the regulation going on in a different jurisdiction, for example, uh, as will be the case for the UK. Another approach would be extraterritorial. The US is doing that a little bit already, applying their own rules abroad in supervision, for example. Uh, and thirdly, there would be repatriation. And I'd be curious, and that's my question, how you feel which area of financial sector regulation to control risks should fall in which category, and more specifically, what is your view with regards to CCPs, the area we're currently working on? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've actually already seen a, an increase in interest rates across the yield curve. And um, our, our assessment is that uh, it's caused uh, by, by half of this is caused by, by increases in real rates and half of this namely linked with improvement, general improvement in economic conditions in the euro area. And half of this has to do with the reduction in the insurance premium for deflation. In other words, markets feel that the deflation has become less of a danger and therefore they need, uh, they need less of an, of an insurance. So both of them are good, good news. Though in the presence of uh, inflation expectations which uh, have only marginally picked up over the last uh, 10, 12 months in a sense, that is the... So has this created a phenomenon of uh, big instability? Not that we can uh, actually assess uh, now. Uh, can we rule out that an increase in interest rates would ever cause it? No, of course not. We cannot, we cannot rule that out. It's pretty clear, trying to uh, address, in a sense, the essence of your question now, it's pretty clear that uh, as the inflation rate will durably converge towards our objective, as this convergence will become more and more self-sustained, countries with high debt and low growth will have to face a higher interest rate bill. And um, from this viewpoint, they will have to have in place right policies to do that, both uh, fiscal but also especially uh, growth-enhancing policies because that is possibly the most important part of, uh, of, their, of their economic policy. Now, do we have, should we think about an institutional setup that would rule out, exclude any possible instability because some countries are lagging behind in their, in their convergence process. Uh, it, well, it probably if we look at the historical experience we had uh, in the early stages of the Maastricht Treaty, it's both things. Countries have to act and put their acts together and put in place uh, sound economic fiscal policies at the same time, you are absolutely right, the nexus between sovereign and banks has to be severed through the introduction of deposit insurance scheme. At the same time, our institutional progress in creating stronger institutions that would resist better to potential uh, instabilities stemming from, uh, from, uh, from uh, states that are lagging behind also should go forward. It's, a, it's an overall all-encompassing process that, uh, that we have to, we have to uh, envisage for the future. Now, on your second question, the, um, let me just refer to the communication by the Commission on CCPs that published on May 4th. And uh, there they foresee a number of different options for strengthening the supervisory regime apl applicable to CCPs, including the enhanced uh, supervision at EU level and or location requirements. It will be ultimately to you, to the EU legislator, to decide which type of regime to apply to systemically important third country CCPs. For the ECB, as a central bank of issue of the euro, it will be crucial that it can at least preserve the current level of involvement over systemically important euro-denominated clearing activities. Regardless of the framework adopted by the EU legislator, 
and of the terms of the future EU-UK relationship. In other words, it's very early for us to so the design exactly the sort of fa final construct. But certainly what we want to preserve is at the very least to preserve the current degree of involvement. So we had to have proper tools uh, under the EU law in order to ensure that can preserve the stability of the currency in the faces of potential risk created by offshore euro clearing. In this regard, we certainly welcome the Commission's communication, and um, that communication fully acknowledges the role that the Bank of Issue has to play in this, uh, in this new environment. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Mato. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Draghi, for being with us again. I'd like to talk about the future and two particular points. Well, when it comes to the political future, there is some doubt. If uh, you look at the uh, recent comments by Chancellor Merkel, um, we can no longer uh, trust people outside us. We have to look inwards more. And then in France, people have said that uh, the things we need to see uh, significant reforms to complete the euro. So there are some countries, and Spain as well, uh, may see may be happy to see more fiscal integration, more supervision, parliamentary supervision as well, and um, finishing off the banking union. So I'd like an assessment from you, if you can, on these proposals and whether you think it would work to have that sort of agenda. And then again, on the future, future on supervision in Europe. Now, the European Commission was carrying out a public consultation on the future of these supervisory agencies and whether they were meeting expectations and meeting the objectives that they had set, what the public thought of that. And I would like to know what you think the future may be there. And then a classic, really, the question I always ask and really it's on everybody's lips, and, and that is do, well, you yourself said quite clearly something that we all uh, agree on, and that is that there is a clear improvement in growth, we're better than 2009, more confidence on the markets, that's without any doubt, and that uh, structural reforms as well are there, and we also have to encourage innovation. Now, there are those who have uh, decided to change their policy on low rates. And I just wonder what do you think the scenarios planned by the ECB would be? Um, now, I'm pretty sure that you're not always going to answer this question, but do you think that there might be a hike in interest rates over the next few months? I'm pretty sure the answer to that will be a blank. And then very quickly, our trade relations with the United States. And Mr. Trump was here just last week. And certainly things are very worrying there, in particular when it comes to the trade relations we may have with the United States. Anything from that on anything on that from you, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll first respond to your first question. Uh, we uh, certainly welcome the consultation process that the Commission started on the role of the ESAs. Um, the, uh, let's not forget that the establishment of ESA in 2011 was a major step forward towards the creation of a banking union, and then it's going to be the pillar upon which the capital market union will also be, be created. It's really the uh, major step towards having a share in one supervision system, a one regulation system in, uh, in, uh, in the euro area, in Europe, actually. We've been collaborating throughout with the Commission and with the ESAs on that. Now, the ESAs have been operational now for six years, so it's high time to have a review of them. And um, now we are currently assessing all these issues raised by, by the consultation paper, and um, it's very, at this point, at this stage, it's very difficult to foresee what future what will be the future of the ESAs, how they will be uh, put together, whether their competence will stay. Uh, the only thing that we could and should do at this point is to have a very strict close collaboration, cooperation with the Commission on, uh, on ensuring that our supervisory system will get stronger after the review 
and also uniform as much as we can, because let's not forget, we still have many national discretion options in various countries that, uh, uh, that uh, make the present system not harmonized fully. fully. The second, second question, as you foresaw correctly, is very hard to answer for me at this point in time. I can only restate the uh, monetary policy stance that says basically the current stance will stay in place until we see a convergence of the rate of inflation, that it's both for the whole of the euro area, an inflation rate of, uh, some, of a level which is close but below 2% for the whole of the euro area, so not for one country or the other country which is durable, so it's not transient, it's not touch and go. It's not like we've seen now where, the, where headline inflation went up to 1.9%, as I was saying before, but it was mostly due to energy price increases, if we look at that, and then now they're going down, and so headline inflation will start going down as well. So it's, uh, we will have to, to be convinced that it's durable, and we'll have to be convinced that it's going to stay there even when we will withdraw the uh, monetary policy support that we have in place today. On the third point is, um, it is in a sense, it's certainly uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are all are concerned. Uh, we are all, um, says the whole construct of the European Union, of the single market, is based on uh, sharing the benefits of free trade. In this sense, now, of course, uh, the, uh, what's happened over the last uh, 15, 20 years is that free trade, and together with free trade globalization, has produced immense benefits, but also has produced uh, people who didn't actually share the benefits. And so we have to do much, much better in sharing the benefits with uh, everybody in, uh, that is participating to, to the process. But in this sense, the, uh, certainly the neo-protectionist stances that, has been, uh, that have, been, um, have been stated uh, in, in the United States uh, are certainly of, of concern. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro Silva Pereira. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, Mr. Draghi, you are very much welcome here. Uh, let me um, ask you uh, two uh, questions. The first one regards monetary uh, policy. As you clearly said to us today, the domestic cost pressures, no notably from wages, are still insufficient to support a durable convergence of inflation towards the medium-term objective. And also, the positive signs should not distract us from the need for firmer and higher structural economic growth. So your conclusion, and I quote, is that we still need an extraordinary amount of monetary policy. Can I uh, conclude from this that the so-called tapering of uh, monetary policy remains out of the ECB intentions for the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, the second question regards the situation of Portugal. As you know, the European Commission has very recently proposed that Portugal should be out of the excessive deficit uh, procedure, taking into account the reduction of deficit and all the uh, positive uh, developments in the economic front, economic growth, decline in, of unemployment. In this context, the Portuguese government, I would like to ask you how do you see these developments? And in this context, the, the Portuguese government has asked to pay in advance a substantial part to uh, the IMF uh, loan uh, that Portugal received. I would like to ask you if you would agree that such uh, substantial payment could also have the indirect effect of uh, addressing the uh, difficulties regarding the limits to the purchase uh, program uh, of the uh, ECB, taking into account that uh, the, um, um, uh, the, those limits are uh, now creating a situation of uh, decline in the amount of purchase by the ECB. Would you think that this would create 
a new room of maneuver uh, allowing for more bonds to be uh, eligible for the purchase program of the ACB. Thank you. O on your first question, really, uh, the answer is very much like the one I gave before about interest rate hikes in the near future. Um, the developments that we are seeing on the, on the rate of inflation um, tell us that uh, the present uh, extraordinary amount of monetary policy accommodation should stay in place until we see, uh, we see uh, developments in the rate of inflation that uh, the rate of inflation converges process that tell us that it's, uh, tra that it's uh, durable and it goes to our objectives and it's going to be self-sustained. In, um, in any event, uh, next week we'll be having the, uh, it will be the next Monetary Policy Council, we will have the new staff projections and new information will become available for the members of the Governing Council. Now, coming to your second question, um, it, significant progress has indeed been achieved in Portugal uh, in, uh, on, on all accounts. And this is the first point uh, that we should uh, have in mind. The second is that, uh, um, the second point is, however, is that um, uh, significant vulnerabilities are still present, especially in the banking sector, where we still have a high level of MPLs, like in other uh, countries, of, uh, especially of the periphery, and these vulnerabilities need to be addressed need to be addressed for their own sake first, for the stability of the banking system, but also for, for, um, for exploiting fully the capacity of the Portuguese banks to support and finance the economy, the real economy. NPLs are a drag on the capacity to give credit to the firms and households that need that. Um, your third point, uh, uh, the answer is I don't think so. I don't think that the payment in advance of the IMF loan actually is relevant as far as the QE uh, limits are concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Werner Langen. Yeah, vielen Dank, uh, Herr Präsident. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you for uh, having made one of your regular visits here. I've got a couple of questions. First of all, a cash circulation and the big hole in VAT revenue. Scientific studies have told us that the two are linked to us, are linked together. Where there is avoidance of uh, VAT, there's a lot of cash going around. We're thinking of 500 uh, euro notes at one end of the chain and the one and two cent pieces at the other. Then I could also follow on from what Jakob von Weizsäcker said, Euro clearing. That is one of the key questions linked to Brexit. Would you think it's conceivable that there could be some form of cooperation with London that could be put together, that there could be cooperation in the form that you might see today under EBA, or do you think it, it would be possible to... Uh, somehow uh, integrate the EBA within the ECB. And then the American uh, situation, it's taken some years for Dodd-Frank to be implemented. That was discussed uh, first of all under Bush and then under Ob Obama during the uh, financial crisis. But now we don't know what is heading our way from the US, what the new president is proposing. He wants, he says, to repeal parts of the Dodd-Frank Act, particularly with regard to the banks. In that case, do you think that there are some risks that we could expect, or are these much more uh, uh, smaller than the, or greater than the public might know at the moment? Well, on, on, on the first point, whether a, an extensive use of cash is associated with tax evasion, especially value-added tax, it's, uh, it, it's likely that this is so, although I, at this point in time I don't have... Uh, uh, I don't have um, a, a precise view. I cannot necessarily respond in writing to, to your point. Uh, but it's very likely that this is so. That uh, international cooperation is fundamental for fighting tax evasion, whether through the use of cash or other means. It's also undisputed nowadays. 
uh, by all our governments, really. So no matter what, uh, what, what's happening, I, that, that's my, obviously my, my conviction, uh, which may well be wrong, but I think that no matter what's going to happen as far as the negotiations between, uh, between in the UK and the European Union, um, the collaboration on, tax, on, on fighting tax evasion will stay in place, will stay in place. Uh, it's something that uh, all countries have reiterated, even in the recent G7 finance ministers meeting. Uh, there was an explicit statement, and perhaps uh, there is a sentence to this extent in the final press communique, to which we can, uh, we can, we can refer. And uh, finally, uh, so, oh no, so second, the, second, uh, the second question was about the EBA and ECB. Um, it, well, not necessarily. I mean, the, first of all, they have different, different functions. EBA is a, is a regulation agency. The, the ECB SSM is a supervision agency. And so we, even though it's not up to us, of course, because it's, up, it's in your hands, in the hands of legislators, we have, a, we have a view that, by and large, the two should coexist. coexist. Uh, they, uh, they also, they are addressed in different countries. The, uh, the geo uh, perimeter is different between, between the two. So, um, the sense, also you had another question at the end about, oh yes, the, the um, it's early to say uh, whether the revisitation of the financial legislation by the U.S. government will uh, address the, that part that has to do with the capital and liquidity standards of the banks, or that part that has more typically to do with um, market legislation, namely market making, Volcker rules, uh, uh, and other other uh, other issues that are closer to market legislation, uh, or to both, we 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 are we are we are in constant touch, but uh, but at this point in time there isn't a clear view on that, and uh, it's actually the, the point you raise is very important because depending on what's going to be decided, there will be a perspective which we're still confident and hopeful that will happen to have a world agreement on capital and liquidity standards. So it has to have a level playing field across banks in, in, in all the world. Thank you. Thank you. Luigi Morgano. Grazie, grazie Presidente. Presidente Draghi. Thank you very much, Chair. President Draghi, um, it is known that your instability is the aim of the institution that you chair and uh, in the employment point is also without strong, solid uh, growth and a growth in employment, then we're still going to have weak uh, inflation, as you have said yourself on more than one occasion in recent months. And you have also reminded people that either in Frankfurt or here in the regular exchange of views that you have with this committee that the monetary policy cannot be the only mechanism for supporting growth in the Eurozone, that there are other uh, measures such as fiscal policy and structural uh, reforms that we need. And so I will, if I may, ask you two questions. Do you feel that monetary policy would be more effective if other than public national public spending that was more uh, favorable to growth there was at european level a fiscal policy that was coordinated and expand of expansive nature as uh, mentioned perhaps by um, Pierre Moscovi Moscovici in 2016. And then second question, the fiscal policy at European level, could that um, guarantee uh, the right policy mix if we had um, balance uh, budget, sorry, for the um, uh, Eurozone based on own resources and whether we, if we had that um, budget, uh, budget um, with a view to stabilization of the economic cycle. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, I've said many times that monetary policy could be way more effective in the presence of uh, policies that uh, are up to the business cycle 
uh, like uh, proper fiscal policy or even more importantly structural policies that increase the uh, level of potential output growth. Um, right now, the assessment of the ECB as far as the present fiscal policy is concerned is that the present, the fiscal policy stance in the whole of the euro area is neutral and it is appropriate. So that's the assessment right now of the ECB. We, we do believe that the present neutral fiscal stance is the appropriate one from the perspective of a, an optimal, so-called optimal policy mix. Um, and yes, also to the second question you made, uh, you, you asked me before. Um, I referred before to the vulnerability uh, or the fragility of the monetary union because of its incompleteness. Uh, some of this incompleteness has to do, there are many reasons, but one of which is the fact uh, that we don't have a fiscal capacity in place. That uh, fiscal capacity is uh, a, a concept that is inherent to uh, all the monetary unions and all the, basically all the, the monetary jurisdictions. How to get there, however, is the issue. What steps are necessary to get there? And I think I've said many times, I don't know where I said it is here, that we really need two pillars upon which fiscal capacity is built. One is trust, and another one is convergence. Trust refers to the fact that in order to have fiscal capacity, share fiscal powers, governments and countries have to trust each other. They have to uh, believe that uh, there can't be permanent debtors and permanent creditors. That is not going to be a permanent transfer union, what is being created, uh, but rather a fiscal capacity that addresses shocks, instabilities, adverse business cycles, and therefore then it reverses things to back to where they, where they were before the crisis. But the second point, even more important, is that uh, countries belonging to a monetary union cannot be too heterogeneous. They have to converge. And convergence means basically structural reforms. And structural reforms are different across countries. Each, one, each, each country of the monetary union needs a certain list, has a certain agenda of structural reforms. So it's very difficult now to set uh, a list that's good for all. But they certainly have to converge, and converge to where? To higher growth together. And we start seeing some of that, as I was mentioning before, through this sort of, we see that the growth in value added is less dispersed than it was before the crisis, way less dispersed than it was before the crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Fulvio Martuscello. Yes, thank you very much, Chair Chairman, and thank you, President. Cash payment is still the instrument that's most used by organized crime and for uh, tax evaders, for money laundering, and for terrorist activities. I'll give you one example. President Modi in India has passed a demonetization uh, law to try and uh, destroy the wealth created by the black market. This has had uh, a positive impact on the uh, Indi Indian economy. In Italy, unfortunately, there's still a lot of uh, use of cash. Despite the high cost of... Uh, well, as a result of the high cost of credit card tr uh, transactions, in some cases, the company uh, takes a 3% cut of the tra in the transaction, and then you have also the credit card fees that are extracted from customers. So I think that uh, there are ways to increase the use of credit cards to try and, pr uh, and uh, encourage electronic payments. 
Italy should uh, carry out some incent uh, efforts to incentivize use of plastic cards to try and reduce the use of cash in payments, and thus try and prevent uh, the circulation of profits from illicit activities. Second question is, Italy is pursuing a route that many people are considering uh, to be rather dangerous. On the, uh, uh, the internet, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, speculation about, uh, on uh, stock market crashes, and the uh, end of quantitative easing is being speculated about quite a lot. And I think that maybe uh, putting an end to it right now might not be the best way to help our economy. I don't know what you think about that. Well, on the second uh, question, I don't really have much of a comment to make. Well, I mean, people speculating on election results and stock market crashes. There's, not, there's elections everywhere. I can't really comment on it. I don't know if I could uh, give you any uh, privilege to... Uh, uh, opinions about uh, speculating on election dates and outcomes. Um, and it's linked with criminal activities. Here we have, um, we have to take stock of the fact that the ECB has actually acted on this front. It's been quite active in, um, in um, gradually scaling down up to uh, cancelling production of uh, of uh, 500 euros banknote in uh, starting with a few years from now. But it has to be acknowledged the fact that different populations in the Euro, in the monetary union, have different preferences as far as the use of cash is concerned. And uh, at the same time, it's also true that cash is being very much used for purposes that are not legal, which can be many. But uh, so, uh, we have to be active, uh, we, while we acknowledge the importance and the, uh, of the use of cash, which has been expressed by several countries and several people, populations in the euro area, we've got to be active about uh, controlling, monitoring that the use of cash it doesn't support criminal activities as well. So you mentioned the possibility of using the uh, credit cards, um, uh, credit cards um, statements for, for, for tax reasons. Yeah, of course, that's, uh, that's something. But national, national authorities have a, a lot of leeway in fighting tax evasion, in finding ways to assess tax evasion, whether this uses cash or not. And of course, also the authorities are, the institutions and the authorities are being active at the EU level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nina Gill. Thank you, Chair, President. Two points. Uh, the latest figures show that unemployment in the Eurozone is at its lowest level in eight years. And it's clear that much of the success is a result of the ECBs the quantitative easing program. And at the same time, you said today that there is a need for higher productivity growth, which requires innovation. Now, innovation in the financial sector is key, but also in other fields as well. And we've just concluded on the G7, and climate change was a key issue there with President Trump's refusal to sign it. But when we look back on COP21, Climate change agreement, which the G20 leaders uh, agreed, was for clear strategic policy signals to increase uh, global focus on green finance. Now, I recognize that what you said, that's important for ECB to have neutrality in these issues, but there's a very clear commitment from Europe that uh, we have to improve the quality of our environment. So isn't it time for the 60 billion euro the ECB invests in quantitative easing every month? Uh, perhaps it should pursue a more bolder and transparent and a green QE. If we don't do that, how else can the ECB encourage the innovation in green, France, green finance? Uh, my second point is on CCPs. 
And I just wanted to pick up your response to my colleague, Jakob von Wetzsecker, and where you stressed that you want to preserve the current regime and tools to tackle potential systemic risk caused by CCPs in third countries. What would you expect? What do you expect in this regard from your cooperation with the Bank of England? And how do you assess the arguments from those against a euro location policy warning that this will lead to a substantial increase in raising bank capital? Thank you. Um, on your first question, um, we, uh, when we designed our, um, our asset purchase program, both corporate and, uh, and uh, well, corporate program, the, the point about green financing is relevant for the bond program, from the, for the corporate bond program. We uh, have designed this program for uh, we, having in mind monetary policy considerations, first and foremost, risk management consideration, and level playing field. So just uh, in order, uh, also answering the question that was, uh, was asked me, uh, was, uh, was asked uh, me before, whether the corporate bond program favors certain corporations or not, uh, the answer is clearly no, because one of, the, one of the reasons, one of the criteria was the level playing field across the different, uh, different um, uh, actors, different market actors. Having said that, the eligibility criteria were broad enough so that many green companies' bonds are also being bought by our programs. So the answer to your question is you would like to see a program which is exclusively limited to green companies' financing. That is not a situation because we want to keep in mind risk management, monetary policy, and level playing field. Does our program accommodate for companies that do respect green finance? And the answer is yes. Um, so the, uh, the second, second question is about, um, is about uh, the, um, well, the present situation. You actually touched upon two, two issues. One is the CCP issue, and the other one is the uh, banks and what banks relocation could, uh, could, uh, could imply. Now, the, the rec of course, the recent uh, UK decision to leave the euros raised concerns uh, regarding the euro system's ability to uh, control the impact of offshore clearing authorities while maintain activities while maintaining the stability of the euro. Now, in this context, uh, we welcome the Commission's work to ensure the financial stability and soundness of CCPs that are of systemic relevance. Now, we know that the Commission communication published on May 4th foresees a number of different options, including enhanced supervision at EU level and or location requirements. And so it's just too early to comment on the future CCP supervisory framework, which will be adopted by the EU legislator. Just to mention the fact that the increased capital requirements that you raised as a danger are more, in a sense, relevant for the banks than for the CCPs. But they could be also relevant for the CCPs as well. Now, that's, that's quite, um, quite clear. We'll have to reflect um, closely and also to listen to, there is a consultation now going on also with the industry. And, uh, and so I think, uh, we, by the way, we are not party in this negotiation, by the way, we are not. Uh, uh, we stand, of course, ready to provide our advice, but uh, we are not party as such to the negotiation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gunnar Hockmark. Th thank you very much. Um, I'm always struck by how eager we are to discuss institutional changes in this house and in your house, rather than the difficult political decisions in order to achieve structural reforms on European level as well as on the member state level. Uh, I, I, I must say, I think that's sometimes like looking for the keys under the street lights uh, instead of looking for where you drop them. 
And we, ha we are not very used to discuss the problems of growth regarding monetary policy. Rather, we have been discussing the lack of growth. But of course, if you have, as you mentioned earlier, very different levels of growth in the member states. You have very different preconditions for the monetary policy. But also, even more, if the levels of potential growth and the possible output and the output gap are very different, then the common monetary policy in, is entering real huge problems. And, and the paradox is that the countries that need most of growth are in the risk of running into problems regarding pressure on inflation and interest rates before those who are having a higher level of potential growth. My, my, my very simple question could be, which would be very difficult for you to answer, but, but that, how, how can we deal with that? But, but if I take a step further on the question, and that would be, shouldn't we in some way put targets on the member states on the level of potential growth in order to measure the amount of needed structural reforms? Because the fact is that where you have low growth, you have a lack of structural reforms, and that is creating a problem for all of us. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with what you said. Um, heterogeneity um, in the sense of having uh, different, uh, if not dramatically different, uh, potential outgrowth growth paths is, uh, is, uh, is a weakness, uh, is a fragility of our monetary union. Uh, there is only one answer to that, however, and that's to undertake the needed structural reforms. Um, now, what could, uh, what could a common framework do to help this process? Uh, in a sense, we do have the beginning of a common firm framework with the CSR, the Country Specific Recommendation, and the Economic Semester, European Semester, and now, uh, so we have to, the, the answer is we have to strengthen considerably this common framework. We have to have in place something you suggested, as a matter of fact, a benchmarking system where countries do share their experiences with structural reforms and, in a sense, very much like they do with budgetary policies, these reforms and their progress are being discussed by, in, a, in a common way, by the member states. I think that is, that is the answer at the present point in time. May I just come back to that? Because I, I agree fully with you, but in, in some way, uh, I feel that we are, as soon as we're talking about structural reforms, we're entering nice talk. We're entering? Nice talk with each other. I mean, we are polite. Yeah. Well. Uh, so we say structural reforms, and we say every country is different, yeah. etc. On the other hand, we know very well what sort of structural reforms that are needed, but they are politically sensitive. But and in some way, we are strict on the stability pact. Well, we are, I would say we are not that very strict, but, uh, but we should be strict. Formally, or we are. But we are extremely vague regarding the most fundamental factors for growth and stability. Certainly, uh, and, uh, and the way to, uh, in the way, in a sense, to overcome this is, on one hand, uh, the Commission's role should be strengthened. And, uh, I mean, the Commission is the guardian of the treaty. The Commission is the guardian of the Stability and Growth Pact. The Commission could become also, if not the guardian, certainly the main um, actor in making sure the countries do respect a process of benchmarking their progress on the structural reform side. So that is, and then we should simply give strength to what we have already in place, namely the country specific recommendations, the European semester. Uh, but what we have to overcome is, uh, uh, is a sense that structural reforms are a national business only. They are not any longer a national business only because the heterogeneity as I was saying at the beginning, is an inherent fragility of our monetary union. Thank you. 
Thank you. Notis Marias. Κύριε Πρόεδρε, επανέρχομαι στο θέμα της... Thank you. I want to come back to the question of the Bank of Greece, which I mentioned earlier. Greece is not participating in quantitative easing. As we know, is you, you can hear the interpretation. It's coming through, is it? Yes. President, I'd like to come back to the question of the Bank of Greece, the Greek National Bank, because Greece is not participating in quantitative easing. And you, in fact, have imposed very strict conditions for its participation. But the Greek National Bank is um, participating in QE, QE and has uh, spent 40.2 billion euros. Uh, we have uh, bonds from uh, international companies, GSF. Um, so the very companies who have imposed the just adjustment plan on us. So my question, can the National Bank of Greece fi buy Greek company bonds and uh, Greek bank bonds? Because the GSPP3 program is quite different to other programs. It, there's a difference between buying state bonds and uh, co Greek company bonds. So why have you made this distinction? Then secondly, on the proposal that I made earlier and following the debate we've had, there is heterogeneity within the union. Some countries are experiencing growth. So there are differences. Uh, some countries uh, have growth, others recession. And do you have a monetary policy which is the same for everyone? Now, I, um, I'm not saying that you should change it, but you should give each national central bank the possibility of applying its own monetary policy, which is adapted to its economy by using QU. Yes, I am uh, winding up now. By using a QE policy, which is equivalent to the level uh, of uh, ECB capital held by the country. He has you more make, feedback. This is the third time you're making this. He same, has more feedback question. now to answer on that. Uh, no, I think I believe I answered this question before. Well, the first, the, on the first point, each QE has its own eligibility criteria. In any event, you mentioned bank bonds. Bank bonds are not part of the QE program in no country. So that is out anyway. Enterprise bonds. Yeah. Company bonds is in the system. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Why don't they... We will make when, when and if, if and when, we okay. will make QE for Greece. We'll have our eligibility criteria there. Thank you. So we have to conclude now. I'm sorry that there is no time for catch the eye, but we are out of time. This part uh, uh, of uh, the monetary dialogue uh, with Mario Draghi as ECB president, and we, and we move to the public hearing uh, with uh, President Draghi in uh, his capacity. Yes, we make first two minutes suspension, and then we will have the second part uh, uh, with the Mario Draghi in his capacity of the chair of ESRB, where I already uh, anticipate we will have to group questions because we have some unexpected time constraints. Thank you.
So, we are here now uh, to our point three, which is, as I said, uh, a public hearing with Mario Draghi as a chairman of the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, not to lose further time, I immediately give the floor to him. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, honorable members of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, it's a pleasure to address you today in my capacity as chair of the European Systemic Risk Board. The ESRB's unique, union-wide, cross-sectoral perspective allows us to identify and to work to mitigate risks resulting from the ongoing changes to the structure of the financial system. These changes provide many opportunities to finance the real economy, but as financial intermediation continues to shift from banks to non-banks, there is a need to identify migrating risks and emerging vulnerabilities. Moreover, we need to develop tools which would mitigate risks to financial stability regardless of where those risks might materialize in the financial system. Macroprudential policy works best when it's implemented in time to enhance resilience and mitigate any build-up of vulnerabilities in the financial system. In this context, I would like to highlight the SRB's work on systemic risks beyond banking. So I'll talk about the shadow banking monitor. I'm pleased to inform you that today the SRB is publishing the second EU Shadow Banking Monitor. This report is a key element in the SRB's risk monitoring framework, which casts the net wide when mapping shadow banking entities and activities. 
some figures. The broad shadow banking system comprising the total assets of investment funds, so including money market funds, and other financial institutions, so including all entities of the financial sector except banks, insurance corporations, and pension funds, today represents around 38% of the total assets of the EU financial sector at the end of 2016. Although the growth in broad EU shadow banking assets has slowed down in 2016, it has expanded by 30% since 2012. In its interlinkages with the other parts of the financial sector are also significant. Therefore, macroprudential authorities need to watch out for the new risks and vulnerabilities emerging in these parts of the financial sector. The EU Shadow Banking Monitor highlights several risks which require our attention. Liquidity, leverage, procyclicality, and interconnectedness are the main themes discussed in this report. I will begin with liquidity risk and the risks associated with leverage among some types of investment funds. Here, I'm mainly referring to investment funds which either invest in less liquid assets while offering daily redeemable shares, or which are highly leveraged. Excessive leverage can act as an amplification channel during periods of financial system stress and lead to fire sales, while liquidity mismatch can also increase risks to financial stability as price movements are intensified when assets are sold in less liquid markets. So you see that risk, uh, risk coming from uh, liquidity, shortage of liquidity, liquidity drying up, and leverage are intertwined. And uh, they can magnify stress in the financial system. Leveraged investment funds are more sensitive to changes in asset prices. Stress conditions may force them to deleverage by selling assets in order to obtain liquidity. Abrupt deleveraging typically involves fire sale feedback loops where there is a risk of liquidity shocks spreading through the underlying markets. Therefore, given that the investment fund sector is growing relative to the financial system as a whole, the SRB is analyzing systemic risk posed by liquidity mismatch and leverage in the types of investment funds exposed to these risks. I hope the report on this work in more detail at one of our next meetings. Leverage and liquidity risks together with procyclicality also need to be closely monitored in the context of the use of derivatives and securities financing transactions, SFTs, securities financing transactions. In derivatives transactions, counterparty credit risk is reduced by the collateralizing exposures through margins, while collateral also plays a central role in SFTs. Haircuts further protect the surviving counterparty against the falling value of the collateral provided in case of default. Margins and haircuts thus contribute to financial stability by absorbing losses and helping to manage the financial risk. They also limit the buildup of leverage. For example, the size of the haircut on SFT collateral determines the amount of funding which can be obtained for a given amount of collateral. Mar margins and haircuts can, however, also be strongly procyclical. At lower levels in good times, they allow the buildup of leverage. When they increase in a downturn, they can lead to forced deleveraging and even trigger negative liquidity spirals. In this context, the SRB recently published a report that considers a number of potential macroprudential tools that target margin and haircut requirements. The SRB also identified practical challenges in implementing such tools that need to be addressed and therefore require further work. Finally, the EU Shadow Banking Monitor identifies interconnectedness and contagion risk both across different parts of the financial sector and within the shadow banking system as potential channels for amplifying systemic stress. Interconnectedness as a natural feature of an integrated financial system and a reflection of financial intermediation flows 
may take many forms. It needs to be monitored given its potential to act as, a contagion, as contagion paths in periods of financial stress. The European Market Infrastructure Regulation, EMER, has given us access to comprehensive data on the real these transactions. These data will enable the SRB to take an EU-wide perspective and examine risks related to the real these markets across entities. To this end, the EU Shadow Banking Monitor, building on the first analysis of EMER data, examines linkages between shadow banking entities in derivatives markets. It finds that non-bank financial institutions are taking a substantial proportion of outstanding trades in the three largest derivatives markets, namely interest rate, foreign exchange, and credit derivatives markets, amounting to 7%, 19 and 10% respectively. Additionally, the report examines the landscape of counterparties with whom non-bank financial institutions engage in derivatives transactions. The EU Shadow Banking Monitor also shows that 60% of the EU banks' exposures to shadow banking entities are to non-EU domiciled entities, which, by the way, is an important consideration in the discussion we just had about CCPs and euro clearing. In particular, the analysis shows the strong linkages between EU banks and U.S. domiciled shadow banking entities. These findings highlight the global and cross-border interconnectedness of the banking and shadow banking system and the need for international cooperation in monitoring and addressing cross-sectoral risks. The risk monitoring framework for the shadow banking system has benefited from recent regulatory reforms and data advances and is already taking shape, but challenges still remain. For instance, additional efforts are required to close the remaining data gaps so as to enable cross-border and cross-sectoral risks to be mapped consistently and to provide a more holistic view of all entities engaged in shadow banking. Also, uh, the, the, uh, in addition to having more granular data, the risk assessment of shadow banking would also benefit from uh, being available on a consolidated or non-consolidated basis. And I've given you an overview of the risks highlighted by the, banking, by the shadow banking monitor. Now let me conclude with some observations as regards macroprudential policy in general. Considerable progress has been made in analyzing the non-banking sector. Let me give you just one example. EIOPA conducted its first EU-wide occupational pension stress test in 2015 and has recently launched its second such test, to which the ESRB contributed by preparing the adverse scenario in close cooperation with EIOPA and ECB. However, macroprudential policy beyond banking is still at the formative stage. While some instruments already exist for specific purposes, a comprehensive and flexible macroprudential toolkit needs to be established. I have already mentioned instruments such as margin and haircut requirements, as well as liquidity and leverage requirements for investment funds. This should all be further investigated, and where appropriate, the regulatory framework should be expanded. Moreover, the design of recovery and resolution regimes for central counterparties and insurance corporation, corporations should have a macroprudential profile. So we raised these issues in response to the European Commission's consultation, and, it continue, and we continue to work on these topics. It's important to give the macroprudential authorities the appropriate tools so that they can act in time. Finally, let me underline the national institutional framework of macroprudential policy are of paramount importance for the policy to be effective. So I'm pleased that we are seeing progress in this regard. In two member states with no macroprudential authority, the legislative process is ongoing. The macropru authorities actively used the available instruments in 2016, in particular to meet the requirements of the CRD4 CRR package, but also to address the vulnerabilities in the residential real estate sector, which I talked about when we last met. The ESRB has recently published a review of macropru policy and take stock of the measures adopted in EU of 2016. Thank you for your attention. I'm disposed of questions. Thank you uh, very much.
And as I said before, due to time constraint, we have this now to group our questions so and to reduce the time for each question to one minute and a half. First question, Mr. Kitsos. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to ask uh, President Draghi his view concerning the risk situation of the Greek banking sector. We had various developments, some negative, some positive, that in my view have to be assessed. For example, non-performing loans remain at an extremely high level, and there was a terrorist attack against Mr. Papadimos ex-Greek Prime Minister, ex-Governor of the Bank of Greece, and ex-Vice President of the ECB, um, probably to send a message on the side of the terrorists against bank restructuring and the management of the N NPLs. On the other hand, the systemic banks approach profitability. Some of them have achieved it already. And the stock market value has increased their stock market value has increased during uh, the last months. So do you believe that systemic risk will be controlled and the Greek banking sector will be able to better finance the development of the Greek economy in the immediate future? Or are we going to repeat uh, problems of the past that led to a recapitalization of the banking sector? Thank you. We group the question. Uh, um, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. The Commission has just published its new proposals on the uh, Capital Markets Union, and they have added a worrying dimension on the macroeconomic stability. From the point of view of the ESRB, do you feel that you have all the tools necessary in order to face up to market, unwanted market movements? For example, securitization, that market. Is there a possibility? Do you have the possibility to intervene if necessary in a given member state? And as we have suggested in under ongoing negotiations, adjusting rates or having measures um, according to the lender, do you think that these are useful instruments, useful tools, so that you have more means of intervention when it comes to stability? Thank you. Anotis Marias. Thank you very much, Mr. Draghi. We're now on the th third package, and we're talking about a recapitalization of just a part. Um, that's to say, 5.5 percent have been actually used, and that means that there you have billions still waiting there to be used. And then you have a major problem with MPLs. The result of that is that many Greeks run the risk of losing their homes. They uh, took out uh, mortgages. They, uh, however, only had 10% of the uh, value of the, uh, of the home underlying it. So How could we deal with these MPLs? Well, we could use use these uh, uh, 19 billion euros that haven't been used. This fund could support families to allow them to pay back their mortgages so that they wouldn't end up uh, being evicted from their homes and that we could have a model that would be similar to that in Cyprus so that those households should be able to buy the house that they risk losing at a very good price. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, welcome to you again, Mr. Draghi. Um, 
One of the biggest risks that we are facing now uh, is related to cyber attacks. Uh, we all witnessed the WannaCry attacks, which uh, was actually a quite harmless uh, ransomware uh, attack, or not harmless, but a very easy uh, attack. Um, but uh, our whole financial system is uh, relying on connectivity, on data, etc. Et so. And my question to you is, do you think that um, in your own organization, but also in the national competent authorities, there is uh, enough priority given to cybersecurity? Uh, do you, for example, think that it should maybe get a higher priority in the stress test uh, of banks because we are, uh, well, increasingly uh, depending on, uh, on the digitization of our industry? A second question is related to the, uh, to the clearing, uh, to CCP. Aren't you afraid that in the current political climate, um, when we are talking about the um, localization of uh, clearing of euros, that, for example, the Trump administration could respond with uh, the wishes that US dollars should only be cleared in the US? Uh, because that is the sort of discussions that we are having. I don't think, well, maybe I would like to hear what your thoughts are uh, on that. And I had another question, but I'm looking at our chair and I will have to ask it another time. Thank you. Excellent. Finally, Dimitri Papadimoulis. Thank you, President. Mr. Draghi, I would like to ask you a question about my country. The European Central Bank is one of the creditors, and all statements that have been made, including yours, indicate that the Greek economy will pick up in the years to come, and that we need a clear roadmap so that after August 2017, my country will be able to borrow on the market at reasonable rates without the need for programs and loans. Now, you expressed regret about the lack of an agreement at the Eurogroup meeting in May. What does you expect of the next Eurogroup meeting? What do you expect uh, in terms of determining this roadmap? You promised this yourself so that you yourself could carry out your evaluation and so that you can uh, include Greece in the quantitative easing program. Uh, uh, at, uh, when will the Greek people and the Greek economy stop paying for the lack of flexibility and the uh, uncertainty of uh, the IMF and others? Uh, the Eurogroup and the Greek government and the Greek people want to have an agreement and a clear roadmap. So when are we finally going to put an end to these incessant delays? Uh, thank you. I'll, um, um, I'll try to respond first on questions on Greece, uh, though I mean, Greece was not explicitly uh, discussed in any SRB uh, board meeting in recent times, for sure. Um, now, on the banking sector in Greece, certainly remarkable progress has been achieved. Um, if we look at, especially if we look at capitalization of Greek banks today, is I don't have the number of hand, but it's certainly multiples of what it used to be before. Uh, the um, the, however, we have a, a problem, this was raised also in another question, we have a very high level of NPLs. And this is in part uh, due to the crisis, in part due to uh, pre-existing weaknesses of the, of the banking system. Many actions are being foreseen in the current program and, in the, and, and are necessary for a successful conclusion of the review. So if these actions, which involve actions by the banks, actions by the government through new legislation, and the creation of out-of-court settlement framework for disposing of the NPLs. By the way, there is one regularity across countries, that the countries that cons consistently 
or that don't have a framework in place for an easy disposal of MPLs, or which have a judiciary process which is lengthy and ineffective, or have a legislative process that is not conducive to a disposal of the MPL, are also the countries with the highest levels of MPLs. And, uh, for example, there are countries where we know MPLs is very much a legacy problem. In other words, it, they were created in the past and are now a stock of activities that uh, hamper the normal credit uh, of uh, the banking system. And countries have uh, produced legislation which is only good for the new MPLs. So it's not good for the existing problem. So we have not, the, that's not the case of Greece, by the way. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that uh, the current program with the current review is addressing. And if all the actions that are foreseen there are being undertaken, will be, will be, uh, will be resolved in time. Uh, by the way, let me, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Lucas Papademos. He's been, uh, uh, he's been a, a great vice president of the ECB a great prime minister, and he is a great, great friend of mine. And I wish to express all my solidarity and all the affection, both me personally, but also all the, on behalf of all the ECB, the ECB staff and the executive board and the governing council members. Um, the, um, we, had, uh, we had about, also sp continuing speaking about Greece, uh, what do I expect for the next Eurogroup? The, the, the response to the debt, uh, to the, to, to, I mean, the agreement about, about debt, what measures concerning debt will make it sustainable for Greece uh, is an issue that's being discussed between member states on one side and the IMF on the other side. I think we've reached a point where the two parties will have to find an agreement. And that's the only thing that's needed really now at this point in time. Let me also add that uh, the, um, the uh, QE uh, for Greece is not to be taken for granted. We'll have to have our own independent assessment and according to uh, scenarios, also adverse scenarios of debt sustainability, and we'll also have to take into account risk management considerations. But I just want to make clear that the debt, debt sustainability assessment undertaken by the Commission, by the IMF, by the ECB in that role doesn't imply the next debt sustainability assessment, which is going to be undertaken by the Governing Council in its full independence. Um, coming to the question about uh, what to do for what macro instruments are available for capital market union. Now, we, we certainly, the ESRB support the initiative to create a, 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 to create a capital market union in, in Europe. Now, it, and we are in favor of diversifying the various sources of financing. But uh, we we'll also be mindful that the policymakers need to have the instruments to prevent and mitigate the new systemic risks that would arise generally in a capital market union, more specifically, as I was saying in my introductory statement, in the non-banking shadow, the shadow banking sector or non-banking sector, with such an extraordinary growth that this sector has had and will continue to have. We haven't discussed much about fintech before, but the fintech development is closely linked to developments in the non-banking sector primarily. So there will have to be, uh, there will have to be macro pro instruments there as well. Now, uh, we, amongst the various things, we see that uh, there is a review of the ESA regulation and there is a, a on-site a strengthening of the ESMA. So we continue to focus on this, and uh, certainly uh, our attention uh, will continue to be high on this, on this point. There are, of course, various measures that will limit the capacity to incur into new debt, so mostly based on the demand side of the macro proof, which seems also suitable for addressing some of the macro prudential problems that may arise in the future in the, non, uh, in the shadow banking sector. Uh, coming to the questions about uh, the question about cyber attacks, yes, uh, cyber attacks should do deserve the highest priority, cybersecurity, 
And, um, and there is now full awareness that this may be the most important problem, is the most important problem that uh, our authorities face. In the last G7 meeting of finance ministers, there was explicit uh, attention given to this point. Various groups, by the way, the problem is being addressed now and discussed in uh, practically all international fora. It's being discussed, of course, by the ECB. Uh, and it's also being addressed and discussed by the national competent authorities. More specifically addressing your point on stress testing banks for cybersecurity, that's very important. It's being done currently by the Bank of England. We are sampling now about the various initiatives that are being taken by the national central banks or the national competent authorities for supervision in the euro area, and we'll move on this ground. Certainly, it is something that it's uh, fully, that fully fledged, um, that, that fully pertains to the stress testing area. So I completely, I completely agree with this point. Um, on the location policy, as I said before, it's very difficult for us to say what is the best final agreement that we can, that the various parties will, uh, will find as uh, we are not party to this agreement. We are, of course, at disposal to give our advice. What is essential for us, and uh, it's in the end, whatever agreement is being reached, what is essential for us is that we have serious powers of oversight and supervision over activity of clearing in euros and activities that may have financial stability implications for the euro area. And um, I will uh, stop here. What about the NPLs in Thank Greece? You. you didn't answer my question. You didn't answer my question. Uh, it remains yes, uh, oh, oh, so, the, so the you, amount you, of money remaining no, for yeah, recapitalization yeah, yeah, right, of banks. Right. No, I answered your question because when I said that Greece was not discussed, Frankly, I have no idea what you want to do with that. Okay, but we thank can, you very I can much. give you. I can give you. I can yeah. give you a written answer. I, okay, I, thank you very course. much. This is a, a hearing on ESRB issues, of course. Um, Philip uh, Lamberts. I don't see him actually. Okay, Barbara Kappel. Thank you, Herr Vorsitzender. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, President Draghi. Well, you mentioned the. Uh, uh, EU sh shadow banking monitoring, and you've talked about uh, the international interconnections and the uh, large amounts of uh, assets that the uh, shadow banks are sitting on. In the Euro shadow banking monitoring report, we've seen that there are problems with uh, data coming from China. The latest available data is from 2010. I was wondering if you could tell us if the Chinese authorities are working together with the uh, FSB and the ESRB as well. This information is important for the monitoring. Are they providing this information or are you having to go to third parties? Where can you get the data from? A second uh, series of questions I'd like to put to you is linked to the ESRB's uh, report on uh, from 2016 on macroprudential supervision there were three countries which had no market supervi supervisory bodies Italy was one of those it was back in September 2016 and there were no implementing uh, uh, regulations for that I was wondering if there was a, now a time frame for the uh, uh, implementing regulations for Italy and I also wanted to know what your priorities are, uh, are in terms of uh, macro supervision of Italy. Thank you. Marco Valli. Sí, gracias, Presidente. Yes, thank you very much. I've got a question for you, President Draghi, on the SRB, and that is the um, European Self Bond? Safe Bond that may put us in a situation of uh, moving out of quantitative easing and um, the issue with uh, interest rates. Now, of course, it will cause a problem of sovereign debt in some countries, including Italy. Now, these aren't euro bonds, these instruments. They are something that uh, don't have the uh, solidarity um, issue for countries who might be at risk. So 
is there would be different tranches divided up between the um, member states when it comes to the securitization. So I think that we would see a real difference between central countries and those more on the periphery. And then there would also be the weighting of the risk in the eurozone countries and the bank balance. Now, the uh, these securities are risk free. So what do you think about this as an instrument? Is it the only instrument that is being discussed at the moment uh, when it comes to the division and the um, sharing of the risk? Because it doesn't really mean that uh, the uh, debt would be sustainable at European level then. So what do you have to say about that? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr Draghi, in the presentation you've just given, the last item was uh, the real estate market. I'd like to comment on that. The demand for real estate and for loans has grown. At the beginning of the year, the ESRB uh, commented on this and said that it did not see any danger for a real estate bubble. I read that position, but the International Monetary Fund responded that they had serious concerns that the real estate market could become overheated and that um, people taking out loans could get into trouble if um, interest rates rise. Andreas Dombert uh, uh, held an event recently in Frankfurt and said that uh, the traffic light is clearly on uh, uh, orange and uh, it's clear that there are excesses in the big cities. So I'd like to know what the ESRB's assessment is of these uh, developments, not just in Germany, but in uh, other regions in relation to the real estate market, I mean. Thank you. Last question, Jonas Fernandez. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, President Draghi, for being here with us. Two questions, very brief ones. The first of these is on the question that uh, was put earlier by my colleague Per Vanche Perez, and that was on current negotiations of securitization, STS. That is something that we are negotiating on with the Council. There is a text that includes the possibility of macro prudential supervision of the securities markets and the responsibility to the ESRB to review the risk retention in those countries where it may arise. So I wanted to ask you about that whether you think the board is in a position to carry out that task. And then the second question refers to what was mentioned earlier about the non-performing loans in the Greek case. But on the board, I think that there is a working group looking at a European response to non-performing loans. And I would like to ask you then how that work is developing. Thank you very much. I, I will respond to the questions in, uh, uh, hopefully, in the order they were asked. Uh, on China, um, the Chinese, uh, China, China government didn't give, didn't supply certain data to the FSB, and uh, we are not relevant for that. We only have EU data. On Italy, uh, the law in Italy has been passed, and uh, the Italian government now is in the process of issuing the relevant regulation. On uh, ISBs, um, the ESRB has a task force where uh, the, the ESRB actually has structured the discussion, initiated the discussion of ISBs. There is a task force chaired by the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, Governor Philip Lane. Uh, ISBs is, um, to say, to say really in, in very, very sort of, um, perhaps to succinct uh, words, is a, a proposal where bonds would be pooled and tranched. But it doesn't imply any joint liability. In this sense, it's not a substitute for a euro bond of any sort. It's just different. And um, so uh, with respect to this, the ECB, not the ESRB, the ECB Governing Council has taken note 
And I would say it's really too early to conclude, uh, to conclude in one sense or another about, about this concept. We, we, th we do believe that the whole work would be finished by year end, by November, if I'm not mistaken, for a final report. Uh, question on residential real estate. Um, uh, residential real estate uh, is prices, uh, house prices have gone up, especially in large cities. In uh, Germany, but also in the Netherlands, also in Austria, also in various, various other countries. And the ESRB has issued warnings to this extent, and warnings that we've discussed, by the way, in the last hearing we had. Um, when we look at uh, prices across countries, of re so we, we move beyond large cities and we try to see whether there is an average, a, a heating in general of the real estate sector in the countries, we, find, we still find that the averages are more or less on the historical averages. So we don't see a special heating of a systemic nature we can see heating in localized markets, but not necessarily in a systemic, uh, on a systemic basis. Let me also add that while we see house prices going up, we don't see credit developing at the same rhythms or even, much, or even rhythms that are comparable with what they had before the crisis. In other words, mortgages, and lending, it's still at a fairly normal pace. So we see prices going up, but we don't see leverage going up associated with, with that. However, there are also, also with respect to that, there are uh, local situations where this, uh, uh, where this happens, actually, where, for example, we have uh, in, some can in one country especially that I can remember, the many many real estate owners uh, real estate owners are now in a negative equity situation where their debt is bigger than the value of their houses with the recovery of house prices these people will be in a better position of course and overall financial stability will be improved the um the, um, the, finally, on securitization, uh, on securitization, the, uh, certainly I do believe that the board of the general board of the SRB is in a position to uh, undertake a review of the macroprudential uh, instruments in the securitization area. Uh, so, and uh, the, um, Final, oh, by the way, it's important. We follow the, the discussions being held in the, in the part, in European Parliament about securitization, and we, by and large, the ECB agrees with what's been said. We, we only uh, suggest special care about raising the risk retention, uh, the risk retention ratios, because as we want to reintroduce this instrument for the financing of the real economy, we think that the features of the instruments being discussed are safe enough as, as they are. Too high retention, uh, retention shares, retention, risk retention shares, threaten to hamper the spreading and the success of the instruments itself. Um, on MPLs, exactly as in the case we were discussing before, for addressing and resolving the MPLs, the actions that are foreseen in the program in Greece that see action by the banks themselves in their risk management and their debt recovery procedures, by the government first and foremost in ensuring an environment that is conducive to disposal of the MPLs, um, by the, uh, in general, by, the, by, by changes in, in judicial processes, out of court settlements and all. So there is a long list of actions that makes one conclude that the creation of an asset management company is certainly useful, but it's not going to be the number one solution for all the problems at national level. Equally so at European level. So we, we look with great interest at these developments, but uh, we shouldn't have any, um, any confidence that this is going to be enough by itself. All the other actions, which often are painful actions, are actually the necessary ones to address this problem.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can conclude also this uh, second uh, hearing. It has been, uh, as always, very useful and interesting. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, President Draghi for having been here for a very long session, very intense, but uh, very uh, positive and uh, useful for our work and our constant dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you.